We're going to build a wall. And, and, no, 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 no. You Listen. owe me money and I want it. Listen properly. How are you money? You owe me money. Uh, the issue is uh, is resolved. There's no money is outstanding. That's for something. My name is Jason Nfusi and welcome to my new show, Political School. Political School is about everything that is everything and anything that is anything. I don't know if that makes sense, but I hope you understand because that is politics. It is everything, it is anything, it is nothing. And that is what we're going to be discussing on the show. We'll be going in depth and deep into what is the understanding of what politics is theoretically, and what is the understanding of what politics is from a bread and butter perspective, of which most the layman understands it from a bread and butter perspective. And sometimes that's how manipulation comes through in politics, you know. And that's how our leaders operate, you know, by being able to manage us accordingly. So this platform is able to give you a viable and resourceful understanding of where politics comes from, how has it evolved, what is it today versus what was it back in the day. Believe me, um, what you see as cold-hearted today is not really as cold-hearted as it was used to happen uh, back in the 400 eras before who who and mang 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 mang. Um, but we'll jump right into it. I hope you enjoy the show. It's going to be a blast. We're going to be dealing with a whole variety of issues, current affairs, Every single time current affairs is very important in us being able to apply the tools of analysis of what we are able to learn through these political school lessons to apply it in our daily lives, but also being able to apply it to hold the executive or the government account. So what is politics? Politics, the word politics stems from the ancient Greek word polis, which literally means city-state, implying the highest form of societal organization, dispensation, you know. Um, but we'll go more in depth about these, these theories a little bit later on. Politics is, is exciting because people disagree. We know politics as a platform to disagree on. Um, who should get what? Who should have power? Should society be based on cooperation and conflict? That's going to be a very interesting concept that we're going to be looking into um, cooperation and conflict keep uh, tuned for that how should collective decisions be made who should have a say how much influence should each person have um, so when you hear these questions it's our normal everyday life questions that is being asked pertaining to politics and that's why some people actually join political organizations to be able to determine some of these questions that I've just raised, you know. Other people do not do it necessarily in such a way, you know, because of different ideological perspectives that is being implemented in different states, continents, you know, what is the influence in factors, what is the history behind some of the things that we are experiencing, you know. For instance, in South Africa, where I am from, um, we've got a national state, you know, we've, we've got a national state, um, and our state generally um, has a democratic view about how things should happen, but it is very, it is, it is micromanaged most of the things by state, where the state is actually just supposed to provide enabling legislation for society to flourish. Most of the time, the state tends to micromanage things in their favor. But we should also be able to look at the history of South Africa in context with where the democracy or the national the nationalism of the party, which is in, 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 in power with the African National Congress is. We should be able to look at the history thereof, of the country, the apartheid era, the colonial era that we, that we experience in South Africa, and the mindset that people still go into the new dispensation with in the new South Africa, 25 25 odd years into the democratic dispensation. So Aristotle um, dubbed politics as the master science. As Aristotle also said that by nature, man is a political animal. 
And we can see that in every dimension of our life, whether it's at home, whether it's at school, at church, you name it, work, everywhere, there's some sort of political influence that one is exerting over the other. If there is people that try to live an idealistic life, whereby everybody is equal and everybody has equal right, equal say. Yeah, we have societies like that in the world, of which we'll discuss them later in the show. Um, but in one way or another, there's always a dominating factor um, that one person tries to play over another person. And this is how the rule of power also comes into a place, authority concepts that we'll be looking in depthly in. But one thing we should also know is that the subliminal messaging that comes through when we speak about politics. You remember the questions that I asked earlier, who should be in power, who should have what have resources, who should the resources be distributed to, who should distribute those resources. You know, there's so many questions around one topic of resources alone that it is, it is unbelievable how many impact it can have on a human being but that impact is determined by so many people and that's why where the theories of conflict and cooperation comes in i'm going to give you the textbook understanding of conflict and cooperation on the one hand the existence of rival opinions, different ones, competing needs, and the opposing interests guarantees disagreements about the rules under which people live. This is, this is conflict, clear conflict. You know, if you have ever been in politics, you will know that every politician has conflict with another politician. politician. You can you take me to court. You can, no, name your kuluma. He's answering this you. This is not your house. Not in your kuluma. Not to send any yako. This is not your house. This is not your house. This is not your house. Whether it's in the same party, whether it's in opposing parties, the ruling party and the opposition party, there's always a different want and need. Although we can say to ourselves, but doesn't these political parties want what is best for all of us? But that's an idealistic way of looking at, looking at it. Um, generally, each party or each organization goes with its own mandate up front. And that mandate is informed by the ideological perspective of that particular party, you know, whether it is reformed capitalism, whether it's far left, far right, far left in the African sense where I come from, which relates to more, which leans more to the communist side of things and the far right leading to more the radical, the radical right, we call it, uh, which leans to your more uh, aggressive, uh, natured, uh, masculine ideologies which tends to remind people of where we come from, uh, such as apartheid, you know, racism, uh, racism as, as, a, as a theory of politics and so on. Um, and these are the various things that we tend to look at um, when we consider conflict in politics. But then on the other hand, we've got cooperation. People recognize that in order to influence these rules or to ensure they are upheld, they must work with others. This is what we call, for instance, acting in concert, that we have got a particular goal to achieve. And in order to achieve that goal, we need to work as a collective to be able to achieve such. For instance, a, a typical example would be <clears throat> Although uh, some may not see it as a very noble, um, a noble example that I'm going to make, but irrespective of it, when Jacob Zuma resigned from office, he was literally forced out. He was pushed out in the public domain. This is, this is well known. He was pushed out in the public domain by the ruling party. This kind of came as a consequence of the him being part of the opposing grouping in the African National Congress and Cyril Ramaphosa ascending to the throne of, of presidency. 
And uh, according to the ANC's um, resolutions, uh, one of the resolutions is there shall not be any two centers of power. Decision making needs to be aligned from top to bottom and from bottom to top. And as a result, the Democratic Alliance for a very long time wanted to push out President Zuma because of various corruption allegations, you know, and because of, you know, there's a lot of politics that comes into play. We are not going to be naive on this platform. We're going to talk about things. They wanted them out also for their own narrow political agenda, you know, and also being able to please their electorate at the end of the day. So in order for the ANC to have pulled off successfully pushing out President Zuma, the initial motion to remove President Zuma was tabled by the Democratic Alliance. Now, this came at the same time that the ANC gave President Zuma an ultimatum that you need to step aside so that we can make way for the new president, which is Sir Ramaphosa, of which at that time the president was not very keen on it. He was like, um, there's no rush. You can still stay. You can stay in your position as deputy president. I'll stay in as the president for about six months. Let's just figure some things out. But the caucus of the ANC was very adamant that we need Cyril to ascend to his rightful position due to the earlier resolution made, I think it was in Mangaung or was it in Polokwane, um, that there shall not be two centers of powers. And as a result, the DA and the ANC ended up cooperating in order to remove the president. Unfortunately for them, there's a flip side to this, the president on the 14th of February he resigned, so there was no need for the, the, the motion to be tabled at the end of the day. So that is an example, a clear example of we've got opposing views, but we've got one common agenda, and we need to be able to achieve this common agenda at any given cost. And that's where some form of cooperation between the radical left or the radical right, whatever you would call it, has to happen in order for there to be a way forward. Some interesting, some interesting concepts that we have to take note of is the concept of authority. So authority can most simply be defined as legitimate power, whereas power is the ability to influence the behavior of others. Authority is the right to do so. Authority is therefore based on an acknowledged duty to obey rather than on a form of coercion or manipulation. So authority boils down to everything. You know, uh, your, 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 your authority in politics is lamented by the amount of power that you have. Consolidate. Baseline. You cannot have authority without power. And we can look at different aspects of society. You know, you look at the Pope. You know, the Pope is seen as one of the most powerful beings on this planet. And as a result, he's got authority over 1.3 billion Christians in this world. The Pope has got authority of 1.3 billion people in this world. And this is supported about by the power that he has that was legitimately endorsed so by his constituency and as a result today he is in power. Concept two, governance. I spoke earlier about governance. Governance is a broad term, broader term than government. So you'll, you'll, you'll get to see in this that governance does not necessarily mean government. Although they go along, along, they're not the same thing. Although it is still not settled or agreed definition, it refers in its wider sense to the various ways through which social life is coordinated. Government can therefore be seen as one of the institutions involved in governance. It is possible to have governance without government. I would just like to repeat this. Government can therefore be seen 
as one of the institutions involved in governance. Governance loosely translated to management, the management of the people's resources. Everything boils down to governance. And your governing authority is provided by the power which you receive from your constituency. I'll say that again. Your governing authority is enabled by the power which you receive from your constituency, your political constituency. You cannot be the head of state in South Africa. You cannot be the head of state in South Africa if you are not, well, the laws has came to change now. The laws has came to change now that, in, that allows um, an individual to be able to stand as a president, as a president elect now. This, this law came in about one, two, three, two years back. Um, I remember there was a constitutional court judgment around it, but that's fine. But as things were previously, you first needed to be nominated by your political party to be in parliament. How do you get in parliament? It's through the power which has been given to you by your political party. Now you're in parliament, the further power which you consolidate in parliament through your numbers that you have, you get a nomination to presidency. The people, remember, the people do not elect the president. Party representatives in parliament rep uh, elect the president. And as a result of the power dynamics that plays out through this channel of the party, the president ends up in a state position as the head of state, the head of cabinet, the head of executive, whatever you want to call it. That is how the system works in South Africa. Whereas in America, they've got a presidential election electorate system. We'll go very deep into those electoral systems at a later stage when we look at different countries, um, comparing them, um, the different electoral systems that applies and so forth and so forth. The principal modes of governance are market hierarchies and networks. The wider use of the term reflects a blurring of the state society distinction resulting from changes such as the development of new forms of public management. Management, remember what I told you? That's the essence of governance, to be able to manage public funds, manage public resources, manage public assets. That's, that's government's role. That's government's role. You, govern, you need to govern in running the public's affairs. The growth of public-private partnership, the increasing importance of policy networks, and the greater impact of both supranational and subnational organizations, which is also known as multinational um, organizations. Very interestingly, the next concept that we are dealing with is power. And power and authority, I've been speaking much on them now. And I'll delve right into it. Um, but before I do so, I want to give a notable figure with relation to um, power, you know. As I said to you that we develop and politics has developed where we are today is as a result of where we come from. We are who we are because of our history. And there is the likes of a gentleman um, by the name of Plato, uh, which is a Greek philosopher. Um, which stems from aristocratic descent. He was born of aristocratic family. And this gentleman was brilliant. Brilliant. Um, he was a philosopher, you know, in ancient Greek times, and he used to have a lot of writings, a lot of influential work that guided some of um, ancient Rome's um, um, way of doing things. His work was mostly authoritarian. Authoritarian means one rule, bed down, <laughs> I'm in charge type of thing. I'm reluctant to say dictatorship because authoritarianism, we still to get to that when we deal with Stalinism. 
And I don't want to spoil it for you now, but there's a very close relation and link between authoritarianism and Stalinism and dictatorship, you know, although it's different concepts, micro concepts and ideo ideological paradigms. It's very interesting how this thing is going to unfold. But interesting enough, he was a very firm opponent to democracy. His work influenced many churches, the social dispensation of what we know currently as Europe. He was very against democracy. He believed that the power or authority in governance and in government should belong to the elite, philosophers, and or kings. Those are the three people you know. And you would know, looking back at ancient Greek, Greece, um, ancient Greek times, uh, ancient Roman times, ancient Persian times, you know, even looking at, at movies of those times, such as 300, you know, Gladiator, you would understand that at that time, there was nothing greater than the, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor was seen as God, you know, and most of these theories have trickled down as times have evolved now, has trickled down, but it's still part of society today. This is still part of the European dispensation. And now we need to understand this thing of politics, how it works. When it trickled down and it tried to modernize um, this, this, this way of thinking, it trickled down into what we know, know now as the times of, 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 of monarchies being established in, in Britain and all of these other countries. And further trickling down to col uh, through colonial entities such as South Africa at the end of the day, which spilled spell over. So to some form or way, ancient Roman methodologies are still being implemented by us, you know, in South Africa, in a subliminal way, but it's still being implemented by us in 2021, some of these Roman, ancient Roman theories. And this is what Plato's idealistic view was, that democracy is not sustainable. Totalitarianism, being um, autocratic, being a dictator is the way to go. And as a result, the concept of power speaks in its broader sense as the ability to achieve a desired outcome. And it is sometimes referred to in terms of the power to do, do something. This includes everything from the ability to keep oneself alive to the ability of government to promote economic growth. In politics, however, power is usually thought of as a relationship that is as the ability to influence the behavior of others in a manner not often which they are choosing to, to, to be influenced on. And that's what I explained from in the beginning. You know, to ascend to president, there's going to be people that you're going to need to overthrow and you overthrow them obviously through a power dynamic struggle which which has to 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 to, to happen in order for you to ascend to where you want to be it refers to the terms of having power over people more narrowly power may be associated with the ability to punish reward bring it close bring it close to force or manipulation. And that is power. So let's just back it up. Power, authority, governance go hand in hand. You can't have authority without having power. There's no need for you to have power without authority. Let's look at our household situation. You know, a modern household situation. Or well, let's go back about two generations prior to me. You know, I'm raised in an African home. 
and I grow up, not even two generations, let's go one back. Let's go back to my grandfather's time because I know how my grandfather thinks. My granddad believes as long as you live under his roof, you shall obey to the rules as said by him. Loosely translated to the rule of law, the, the household rule of law, not the constitutional rule of law. And if you break those rules, you will be punished or there will be severe consequences or any type of consequences for your actions. If you behave accordingly, you will be rewarded accordingly. And that's how power works. Because of the authority that he has at his home, he gets to determine the discourse of how his family should live. He has the authority to govern how his family should live. When the family should go to church. What time the family should watch television. What time the family or the children should be at home. He has the power to legitimately govern through authority what time you should be at home if you are still under said age limit, you know? This is the most typical example of how politics even comes into play. Because earlier I mentioned to you that politics, which stems from the word polis, which means city-state, literally means how to form a social organization which you are able to manage accordingly in order to achieve your desired outcome. Now the desired outcome may be your fathers, the presidents, the priest, whoever. They're all part of the social construct and they are seen as actors. We are getting into the deep and dark sides now of politics. So concepts, models and theories. A concept is a general idea about something, usually expressed in a single word or a short phrase. The likes of law, society, citizenship, you know, it describes something, um, but it provides a backing idea of it. The concept of a lion is not the thing, but rather the idea. An idea composed of various attributes that give a lion its distinctive character as the king of the jungle, the undisputed king of the jungle. We cannot, we cannot dispute that. And as an ultimate predator, concepts are used as tools in which we think, criticize, argue, explain, and analyze. And I, I use, for instance, law, you know. We're able to critically think, analyze, argue, debate the law. And that is what a concept is. A model is usually thought of as a representation of something. Conceptual models are analytic tools. Their value is that they are devices through which meaning can be imposed upon what would otherwise be bewildering and disorganized collection of facts. Facts don't speak for themselves, they must be interpreted and they must be organized. So, a model is our basic sense of what is regarded as part of the tools of analysis in politics. For instance, system analysis or public choice. When we are debating a particular matter and something arises and there is some sort of conflict, we are able to use a model to be able to demonstrate to what we are perceiving through this particular um, uh, model that we are illustrating. The term theory and model are often used interchangeably in politics. Theories and models are both conceptual constructs used as tools of political analysis. Moreover, a theory is a proposition. A theory offers a systematic explanation 
of a body of empirical data. So examples of concepts are power, social class, rights, law. This is all things that you're able to debate, criticize, you name it. Your models and micro theories stem from social systems, public uh, choice, game of theory. It's things that you're able to actively analyze through applying certain tools of analysis. Micro, macro theories are things such as pluralism, elitism, functionalism, factionalism. Very active, active theories. Very active theories in our daily lives. Ideological traditions or paradigms stem from liberal, liberalism, Marxism, capitalism. So what is very critical for every politician, every public relations student, any public governance student, any political student, is to know what is happening in and around of them. Current affairs is a crucial part of the political discourse. And as a result, you need to know what's happening in your community, in your country, in your world, economically, socially, politically. You need to be abreast with whatever is happening. So. Um, we'll take a look at the current affairs. It is that voter registration weekend will be from the 17th and 18th of July. The IEC confirms. Um, you would know that um, in the South African general elections will be taking place on the 27th of October, if memory serves me well. This was announced by the presidency sometime last month. Um, and yeah, we'll be heading to polls as South Africans to elect our local government leadership um, come 27th October of this year. Now, I wonder how this is going to pan out, you know, with um, the ever more threat of um, the, the, the third wave of COVID being upon us, how is it going to play out? I know our South African um, electoral system is not world-class. Will we be looking at mail-in ballots? But IEC is not as efficient and effective, honestly speaking. Um, so I don't know, are they going to be implementing such models similar to what we saw in the US, um, the mail-in ballots? Um, not only the IEC, but our post office is not very an effective unit. This just comes back to the fact that our state-owned enterprises are in a very, very problematic state. And I really hope that government can really take this bull by its horns and sort it out, especially with regards to the post office. So many good services could be done through the post office, uh, such as banking, uh, you know, the, the, the sending of parcels, whether it's national or international, the post office could be excelling. You know, looking at models such as FedEx, uh, I just don't know. But I, we, we, we digressed. Um, 17 and 18 July um, is voter registration. Go out, get registered. First time voters, make sure that you go out and vote. Very important. If you don't vote, uh, you can't complain. And there's really a lot to complain about just naming one, the post office. Where I live, the post office is even closed. Uh, you know, they didn't pay rent. So <laughs> it just it just shows the, the rot is very deep. But yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. What's, what's next in the news? Diwate says ANC is not broke. We're just experiencing cash flow problems. Here's the thing. You're the governing party. Let me just give you the background. About a couple of weeks back, reports came through that the ANC could not pay its staff at Lutuli House um, anymore. And this was as a result of malmanagement that happened three years prior to the, 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 the new administration of Sir Ramaphosa came in. The, 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 the previous administration paid salaries, but their payee, which is our code for paying um, employee-related taxes over to the, the revenue agency, 
was not paid over to the revenue agency. You know, it was not collected by them. They did not receive it in whatever way, form, sort. Yes, they did not receive it such. And as a result, the bill piled up to about 15 million rand. Now, the current administration has got a problem of dealing with um, outdated tax matters because the taxman came knocking at the door. The issue here is that there's a discussion of implementing some sections of the Labor Relations Act, um, which will provide um, the ANC with the platform or will give them the platform to retrench some stuff. Perhaps this is a discussion that is happening, depending if the situation worsens or the, if it gets better. The problem with this is, but as the governing party, which goes every February, has a State of the Nation address. Every February to March, followed by a budget speech. The president says he's going to create jobs. The president says he's going to create smart cities. Industries will be enabled, um, backed by the finance minister saying that um, this and this sector will receive priority financing, infrastructure, construction, textile, blah, 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 will be financed uh, this financial year. And it would support the creation of so much and so much jobs being created, X amount of jobs being created in the economy. Now, as the president of the country, which is also the president of the ANC, you cannot be seen backtracking on that commitment that you made in parliament by your own house being retrenched. It can be. President, you are a billionaire. You need to figure this one out. If you're listening to me, President Sir Ramaphosa, you need to honestly figure this one out because it does not send a very good statement to the constituency, to the South African populace, which is not ANC members, but supports you at large, that your own house, you are going to have to people because uh, of malmanagement that happened in the ANC. The ANC which is the governing party, cannot pay its tax obligation, let alone retrenching people. You've, 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 got, you've got too much problems. You need to solve it some way. But you cannot, one, you cannot retrench people that works for the governing party and then still expect the people to vote for you that you will be able to create jobs for them next year. Then there's a matter of the Secretary General. The story broke sometime um, March, what was it, April. Sometime April that the ANC had an NEC meeting or NWC meeting. And in the NWC meeting, they resolved that the step aside resolution will now be implemented, giving effect uh, within 30 days, meaning within a 30 day period, members which has been formally indicted, um, and is facing criminal charges, corruption charges, um, pertaining to corruption, maladministration, money laundering, you name it, should step aside from the ANC. Fair enough. Love this resolution. It brings accountability now. It says that the ANC is ready to deal with issues. The ANC is ready to self-correct. But is the ANC ready to self-correct? This is what the message said. Secretary General said, give me 30 days. ANC said, fine. Not only you, but many other members across the country of the ANC, which is implicated in such matter. Give you 30 days to step aside. Get your affairs in order. As you said, I want to go and consult. He said he wants to consult President Zuma, President Mbeki, President Mutlanti. We also know that in the ANC, they deal with deep, deep factional issues. And as a result, as a result, stepping aside was not going to be as easy as we could have as expected. And this is where tools of analysis comes in. You don't only analyze what is happening in state. Politics reaches far further than that. You even start to analyze the person. You start to analyze the character of the person in a position of power and authority. And you are able to generously 
predict what would be the outcome. And I think a lot of political analysts saw it coming that this gentleman won't step aside and he did not step aside. Instead, he wrote a counter suspension letter to President Sindra Ramaphosa, which is a very big problem. It would have been fine if President Sindra Ramaphosa was formally indicted. It has serious security issues and consequences for the country, that particular allegation. The suspension letter has even worse uh, uh, implications for the country. And as a result, I, I, uh, the, the, the ANC came out of the NEC meeting saying that the SG has to um, apologize within uh, a set period of time and um, we'll, we await. We await such, such a response from uh, the, the, the SG. Um, but the person that we've now came to know him to be, I would not expect much at this particular point. Looking at the dynamics of the ANC, analyzing it very objectively, coming out of the Nazareth conference, there was never really a unification point for the ANC. Irrespective of the drive from one force to unify, the other force was very resistant to it up and until this point. This force has been so resistant that they have even created a movement of its own called the RIT forces. The organization was not created with pure intentions because it seeks to only further a narrative that is held by a select few, that is driven by a certain elite in this organization. And as a result, the ANC is experiencing this crisis that we see now. And um, it is inevitable what is going to happen in the ANC. Some other comments have made uh, similarly very really serious remarks about the state of organization. Uh, the comrade Trupo, I think that's how you pronounce the name, much earlier had called for a retreat. And he said that retreat must discuss this question. Do we still have any organization called the ANC? That's a very, very serious challenge, uh, comrade Chen, comrades, that uh, a comrade says we need to meet, he said, two or three day retreat seriously to look at this matter. Is followed by Comrade uh, Batabile, and also who was, uh, and Comrade Moore who spoke in, in support of Batabile, they, they, both of them representing the Women's League. And the central point that Comrade Batabile made is this, that the movement is about to collapse. I'm saying, Comrade Chair, you have this uh, question. Do we still have any organization called the ANC? Second Comrade says, on behalf, of, on behalf of the Women's League, the movement is about to collapse. But I would not want us to ruin political school for these purposes. I would love us to further engage the tools of analysis and apply them as we go. Another story is the ANC step aside resolution is not aimed at Ace Mahashule, as I mentioned. Um, various other leaders have stepped aside. Mangusutu Butelezi, when is he retiring? I see now he says, I will retire from parliament once a land expropriation law has been passed. This is a very interesting thing, you know, and we'll get to the theory and We'll get to the ideology of nationalization. We 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 very popularly in our in our societal cont context we hear nationalize the banks, nationalize uh, uh, all other private owned institutions. You know, nationalize, nationalize, nationalization, uh, expropriation of land without compensation. These are very good rhetoric, yeah, especially when. You are in um, election here like we are. He's a politician. Um, irrespective of how old he is, 
he knows how to play the game and this is a very good thing for him to say especially for his uh, party seeing that um, um, they are the second biggest uh, party in KwaZulu Natal um, it will be very good for his party if his party can reclaim back the province you know and be at the helm of the province again and have the premiership of the province and uh, the entire cabinet of KZM. But we'll be looking very deep at what expropriation of land is at a later stage when we talk about nationalization. Um, and is it really a good form of, of, of policy? We'll be looking at comparative politics, similar, similar states, uh, similar systems that has underwent um, expropriation of, uh, of, of land. Um, whether it is with uh, competition or without, we'll be exploring those dynamics. Looking internationally, um, in the ongoing spat over the January 6, um, <clears throat> Over the January 6 debacle, uh, where capital was somehow overthrown by radicals, people just went and then whilst Chambers was in session, they just tried to create anarchy and everything, you know, all at, I don't want to say the direct, but somehow the indirect instruction of then President Trump. And as a result, President Trump is then subjected to various forms of uh, uh, public scrutiny and um, uh, the, the, the second impeachment trial, which is on the cards. Um, it will be interesting to see how this matter pans out um, and, and, and if the GOP, which is the grand old party, uh, how they back President Trump. You know, we, we all know he's got ambitions to come back in 2024 or is it 2025 um, as the US president. Um, with the second trial on the cards, I know very much that the Blues are working very hard to keep him out of the Oval Office. But now with, and the question is, is the GOP supporting him to come back uh, for a, se a second term? And that is very crucial, you know, for us also to analyze and try and understand what is happening. I just see here, um, if I can just read out, today we face a threat America has never seen before a former president who has provoked a violent attack on this capital in an effort to steal the election has resumed his aggressive effort to convince Americans that the election was stolen from him. So this is the ongoing articulation from the Democrat side that um, the US president did this or incited a mob to, to, to overthrow capital. Um, with the attempt that it can disrupt the work of, of, of the, the House at that point um, from, from, from reaching a conclusion um, in moving to the next phase of the new transition to the, to the Biden transition. Um, you know, obviously, President Trump claimed that um, the elections was rigged, it was stolen, you know, the mail-in ballot votes was... was Casted weeks in, uh, in advance, you know, some states were stolen, some counties were, were, were irregularly taken from them and so on, you know. Although they launched various appeals at the courts, but it did not seem like he was successful in his bids to the courts. Um, so, yeah, this bet is ongoing. It's very important. This, this is a very important development that America has seen as a number one democracy in the world. We, we see it with the best laws, with the best crafted constitution, you know. Um, if you don't like something, it's easy. You can just plead the fifth. Um, uh, but now, what is very important is, is the security threat that this pose that just so easily the American capital can be overthrown by an angry mob. And I don't believe that the Biden administration, the Democrats, and even some uh, within the GOP um, would just let this slide and allow 
uh, President Trump to come back. But this will be very interesting to see and analyze going forward. Leave your comments down below on what you think will be the outcomes. Obviously, it's too early still to judge the outcomes of, of, of uh, the pending trial, of the pending processes that is happening for President Trump. Um, but yeah, it will be very, very, very interesting to see what happens um, in this particular matter. And with that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, my viewers, very much for watching today, tuning in to the political school, or rather political school. Um, it has been very educational for me, and, as, and I hope as much as it is for you. And we'll see each other on a weekly basis, discussing new theories, new concepts, um, new ideologies, and different systems, etc., etc., etc. We've got a lot of work to cover. We've got syllabuses and syllabuses to cover. So for those political students seeking to find an easy way out in understanding politics, here's an hour worth of interesting information um, which might be able to assist or aid you at your studies. For the politicians, please do watch me. Please do watch me and um, I know you're going to try and drag me for things that I say here. Um, so be it, man. Let's, let, let's take it. We need to, to rehabilitate some political minds. And this is what we do because sometimes political facts are distorted extremely. And this is what we are trying with this channel to trying to, to change. We're trying to change the narrative, the mindset of politics, and to try and get more and more young people involved in politics. Get involved, young people. Get involved in politics. We need you. We need you to make a change in this world. So thank you very much. Till next time, adios muchachos.